as we move through, uh, we really want to find out what tier one solutions for analysis services have in common. So what I mean by tier one solutions, first of all, we're talking about the big cubes. We're talking about uh, cubes that are potentially uh, in the terabytes or have, you know, up in the fact tables or measure groups that have billions of rows. Their current, really, their makeup <clears throat> really shares a lot of common properties, and I've got them here on the slide. You have a lot more design and query consideration. We've got uh, a much higher concurrent user count. Uh, we've got increased hardware requirements. They're very I.O. hungry, so we'll talk a lot about I.O. and, and I.O. optimization here as part of this uh, presentation here in a little bit. They also typically have some real-time implications. Those implications are really driven from uh, hopefully not the entire very large cube, but certain portions of the cube that need to be made available to uh, end users uh, a lot more often from a data avail availability perspective. Um, we've also got some proven strategies that work for these types of cubes. Um, they are proven uh, because they're running in real world scenarios. So we'll talk about some of the case studies that are out on SQLcat.com. You'll hear me reference SQLcat.com, S-Q-L-C-A-T.com several times today, largely because uh, that's where my uh, guys and gals who are my, my buddies out on the SQL Cat team post all of their white papers and recommendations and all the great work that they do working with real world customers uh, in the toughest situations in the world. Uh, they, they push a lot of that information back out to us uh, through that website, which is a really tremendous uh, opportunity to go learn some new stuff. When we think about design and query considerations, our primary focus is around simplicity. So the larger your cube gets and the more heavily utilized your cube gets, the simpler it has to become. Things that are going to have to get thrown out eventually as you begin to grow are things like parent-child dimensions. It doesn't mean that you can't have a parent-child type of relationship in your cube, but it means that you need to flatten it out in your dimension table. And there's some tools. Uh, Bids Helper is a, is a great tool that's out on CodePlex um, that has a, a, a hierarchy naturalizer built into it, which will create a flat table from your hierarchy. Many-to-many um, -many relationships, when they get very, very large, that bridge table in the many-to-many -many relationship, if it gets typically over about um, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 50 million rows, um, it tends to have some serious performance problems. So you really want to be careful about your very large many-to-many -many relationships. We've also got cell-by-cell -cell versus block mode. And really, block mode can also be referred to as subspace computation, which is a much more complicated way of saying we're going to have to iterate through cells or we're going to be able to ignore empty tuples or empty cells in analysis services to be able to optimize processing. How do we do that? There's a, uh, there's a turbo button on the front of your server. You just hit that and, uh, no, just kidding. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to do some research in the analysis services performance guide, which is a white paper out on SQLcat.com, and it's going to tell you some different things you can do in your MDX queries to make sure that you're taking the most optimal path, which would be the block mode, which ignores those empty tuples, doesn't, exit, doesn't iterate through them. You also want to be careful with your data types. They're in, up until analysis services 2008 R2, there's a four gig string store limit. Um, what that means is the more string values you store in your cube, there's a chance you may run into that four gig limit. Um, that is a four gig limit per cube, and it's compressed, so that data is going to get hugely compressed. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but you still want to be careful about storing very large uh, data types. In your in your cube, that's especially for large cubes. You want to be very very careful there. Um, the uh, that particular string store file under the covers has probably the worst uh, file extension of any file I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, it is a .asstore file, which I think is uh, uh, gets some snickers from people uh, typically when they see it the first time. Um, partitioning and locking, we want to make sure that we're using partitioning in our measure groups. That's going to really give us a, a partition elimination with our queries. It's going to improve the way that uh, analysis services is able to thread and manage the execution of those particular queries. 
Uh, we've also got better management of our hashing and locking pools uh, based on partitioning. So when we're trying to create hashes between our dimensions and our fact tables, and when we're trying to take locks on those tables uh, and in those measure groups inside of our cube, we want to be able to only lock the portion of rows that we're really concerned with. Same type of principle if you've ever done uh, partitioning in a data warehouse or in an OLTP database. We also need to manage multi-user concurrency a little bit better. So as we begin to scale out, we can do things uh, to keep multiple copies of our database in sync. We can look at read-only databases. We can use uh, sans snapshots and clones, not cones, um, ice cream, waffle cones. That's not really going to help you. Um, but you get one if your scale-out uh, solution works. So we can go with that. Um, you can also look at improving your system engineering relationship. Uh, I often tell people as soon as you begin to get a very, very large cube, if you're not the one who owns the storage and the, the servers that are actually going to run that, you should be finding out what they like for Christmas, what their favorite kind of beer is, if they like scotch or wine or you know, flowers for their wife or flowers for their husband, whatever it is, just keep them supplied with what's going to keep them happy uh, because they're going to be doing a lot of work to help you benchmark and make sure that these environments are, are really up to snuff. We also want to make sure that our memory management is, uh, is up to par. One of the things you're going to be able to see here in these charts is as we begin to scale out uh, on 80 concurrent users, formula engine and storage engine heavy queries uh, really begin to uh, leverage that scale out process a lot better. And what we're looking at is the, uh, the milliseconds that it takes for the, or the seconds rather, for those large queries to come back. Um, these are very, very large queries, so you're looking at uh, you know, a fact table with you know, multiple billions of rows, uh, and of course as we scale that out, uh, we're able to bring those queries back off faster. Memory configuration, this is an important one. This is one of those slides I added for my best practices presentation because the, the tier one system doesn't quite take this into effect, and I think this is, a, uh, this is an important set of points to, to keep in mind. Um, while you guys read the slide, I'm not going to read the slide directly. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what these different types of memories, uh, mem what these different types of memory do within analysis services. There's really two primary types: shrinkable and non-shrinkable memory. Shrinkable memory can go away essentially when analysis services is under duress from a memory perspective. Non-shrinkable memory cannot go away until analysis services is completely out of memory. Uh, which is that hard memory limit at the very uh, bottom of the slide. Shrinkable memory comes into play because analysis services uses what they call an economical memory management model. Um, I don't think they could have come up with a longer name for that. They should have just called it the tax code. 